Well, we what have, a club we have, have other than family and golf and beer. We have 2,000 adults at our club and 2,000 children under 20. So, you know, um, that, that lends itself to an array of sporting activities. So, obviously, golf is the king. I'm not going to, I mean, I'm sure it's the king here, okay? But it doesn't mean that there's not a prince. You know what I mean? So, in the, you may have a pun on words, Prince Racket. <laughs> you know, there's just, there's, you know, tennis doesn't rival golf, but it's it's just as important, just as important as, you know, the field goal kicker is important on a football team. You know, the quarterback's more important, but you need both. And, and so our tennis is really important from the athletic, but the kids. Right. Can you just clarify, I'm sorry, exactly what you're trying to get from us? Uh, when we well, I mean, you say it is becoming more family central. Yeah. What was it before it was family central? It was more, for us, it was more just, just women. Ours used to be more just women tennis players and dads would show up. Ours is now the whole family shows up on Saturday afternoon. We do more activities for the entire family. Um, we don't have them just demographed as ladies golf, ladies tennis play, or men's USTA at night. We probably <laughs> have five things a week with the whole family at night. Right. See, a lot, Which a lot is of, different. A lot of clubs will promote that because they they know intellectually that you know people deciding to join a private country club today when you can have <coughs> money to join a lot less expensive clubs. Uh, the reason why they say that is so that they want the, them to say, okay, I'm gonna get value if I join that club because it's family central. But the proof is always in the pudding. You, a lot of clubs will promote that they are family central or family centric, and they don't have the junior yes. programs. They don't have that kind of. You have to you have to walk the walk. We have we have a family tennis events together where sure. mom and dad and kids and everybody can hit and can play and dad can drink ten beers at the same time. You know, and I mean, just uh, mom can too. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you're you're a prominent yeah. we're, 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 we're probably two and a half to one in terms of golfing members versus tennis members. But I will tell you this. 60% of the participants in tennis are from full golf. That's good. Yeah. Actually you know, did so a study, actually did a study it's, it's, to see where the money was coming from yeah. and to characterize it. Yeah. And the largest amount of money spent in tennis operations were from golf members. Absolutely. So which tells me that, it, and we have a lot of uh, members, would you agree, that, that cross over. Now, um, Jason and Jason and Kevin and my golf, my golf pro, which is kind of getting into another answer, but I would tell you they work collectively to try to do joint functions. Yes. And so what's happened is now we're finding that we've got a lot of guys doing both. We've got a lot of women crossing over too. Because in my role is if I can get everybody engaged in some sport, when those kids grow up and move away, I'm not going to lose those people. Because if I can keep this club as the center of their social life and their hub, they're not going anywhere. People don't give up what they care about. I need them to care about that club as, as much as they care about anything else, and then I don't lose those, those dues revenues. But, um, but I will tell you that just for us, we spend approximately $300,000 a year in just children programming. So that's family focused. And folks, what are, if I'm gonna, uh, we have a, a bunch of questions we want to go through, and some of them I think will be answered mm -hmm. from, the, from the audience. So let's reserve the questions at the end, and if your question is not answered, then we'll try to get your, get your question. I want to make sure we get through um, some of the relevant questions that we put together. And this one has to do with budgets. And budgets are always a main operational duty at country clubs. At your club, how does the tennis department budget compare to the other departments? Is it self-sustaining? Is it partly subsidized by the general operational budget? Or is it completely underwritten by the general budget? And Kevin, we'll have you. Yeah, um, ours is uh, partially underwritten by the general budget. It is. Um, it does run at a deficit. Some of the operational expenses are offset by some of the revenues derived from shops and a few other things. Um, we derive those budgets. I have a pretty good idea percentage-wise. You know, obviously, golf and food and beverage are our profit leaders. They actually make a profit, uh, but 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 that's all. They can be manipulated, so it's not even fair to say that. You know, so but it's all dues revenue. Um, and I'll be kind of quickly on this. We, um, we consciously subsidize some of the food and beverage activities that go on at tennis so they do not fall through the tennis budget 
to keep that budget at a certain dollar amount. Now, people would say that's not right or not, but, but I don't really care. You know, I, I kind of know what's the right number we need to achieve. Lorenzo's in the back, he's the clubhouse manager. I just tell him, you eat it in food and beverage and you take care of tennis on certain things. But, but this is just my philosophy. If you want a great tennis program today, have some great food and beverage giveaways sometimes and do some freebies and make the members happy. So, I made my speech. Yeah, I mean, I, it's very, very similar to what you just said, Gavin. Uh, uh, you know, we don't make money uh, at tennis, but we don't intend to. Mm -hmm. um, just, I don't make money at the pool, and people would not join this club if it wasn't for those two facilities. So it's, it's that simple. And again, uh, to his point, which I really like, Gavin, is that we can manipulate the numbers any way we want. At the end of the day, if we want people engaged, we've got to be creative. Yeah, but. It's, it's not, it's absolutely not all about the bottom line when it comes to that because it's that dues revenue that in a private country club is key. Right. So as long as you're happy, you're going to keep paying that dues. So every club has its own benchmarks and whether they want to make money in food and beverage or lose money in food and beverage, it's whatever makes the member happy, whatever the lion's share of their members will appreciate. As long as they can get that dues line, that's all that should matter. I want to thank Diana. Okay. Yeah. No, that you said it. You said it perfectly. You just said, "Well, all, we all want to keep the dues rolling." Right, that's right. We want to keep the dues rolling. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Very good. Let's move on to question number four. I think this is an interesting one, and uh, I know you folks <coughs> had a little time to, to think about it. The tennis professional wears many hats, as do many other staff at other country clubs. He or she must be multifaceted to succeed in a club environment. And can I ask you, each of you, to rank in priority what is important to you and your club when hiring your top tennis staff, <coughs> given the characteristics, the following characteristics and qualifications? And I just listed five communication skills, problem solving skills, tennis playing skills, budgeting skills, and programming skills. Uh, so, Howard, let's, uh, let's start with you. I want to go first on this one. I'm going to have fun with it. I'll, I'll be very interested to see. You want me to go first? No, no, no. I'm ready for this one. Yeah. 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 Well, well, we can all, I'm sure we can all back up our, our right. perspective. Um, I put uh, number one to me was programming skills. Number two was communication right behind it. Uh, three was problem solving. Four was uh, budgeting skills. And uh, fifth was tennis ability. I'm going to go a little off script on this one here. Um, but, I mean, I, in that order, if I had to just choose those, I would, but I think there's maybe a few missing. <laughs> 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 That's good. That's good. I do. Because right, right. in my mind, if you're right. to be a professional, right. I'm going to assume you can play tennis. Right. Good point. Um, budgeting, you can teach somebody to play <laughs> um, So, to, to what I think is missing in this list is leadership. And to, to be honestly, I think it's, I mean, and obviously communication and problem solving skills are a part of, of leadership, but um, I, I have to tell you, I just, I think it's about, it's about having somebody that can mentor both their staff and to mentor the younger kids that are coming up. I think there's more to just in a ju junior program. I think you're learning or you're teaching, or I know we do at Valentine, you're teaching life skills. Um, you know, their parents aren't raising them, somebody has to. So anyway, <laughs> so um, yeah, so as you, so I just, I think there's a, a social responsibility to these kids to do mentoring. Um, I think leadership is about being a good team leader. I think it's about being um, part of a team. I think it's ethics. I think it's integrity. So, you know, um, it, in my opinion, if, to be honest with you, I can teach you to budget, I don't care. But if you're showing me leadership skills, and you're showing me that you're gonna stand above the pack and all that, that's probably what I am looking at. And not just a tennis professional or a head tennis, I'm looking for that in all of my people because that's probably what's important to me. I had answered it in none of the above. <laughs> oh, did you? You did. I said, you're awesome. I put, uh, I put attitude in chemistry and then I put slash leadership. You know, for me, um, since, since two of our two two department heads are here, if you come, and it, and it trickles down to everybody that works for us. If you have attitude and chemistry, we're going to figure out the rest. So for, from Kevin's standpoint, it's leadership. He has all of that attitude and chemistry. That's good. And then I, I always, yeah. Because I've had bad yeah, attitude. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. So you know what I mean? I think it has a lot to do. You know what I mean? Okay. We're all managers. And then 
for, for those of you that have staff, you know, don't you just want attitude and chemistry at the end of the day? It's like, would you please show up and do your job and just do what you're, you know, and so budgeting doesn't you. matter because I'm going to tell Kevin what the budget <laughs> is anyway. <laughs> so, you know, skill set, like you said, comes with it. But leadership, I mean, everybody in this room is a leader. You wouldn't be here. You know, I mean, you're you're the rest you have to have an ego and, and have a leadership skill to be, <coughs> especially as leaders, you have to be able to take combat. The tennis professionals get beat up. You know, I mean, yeah, they have the B team, the like C team, the A team. Don't tell know. me. If anybody get a chance to tell one great Glen Eagle story before this day is over? Okay. Thanks. My favorite line. I should have gone down. I know. I know. Oh, that's the greatest. I think um, from the tennis pro standpoint, we're hiring other pros, but we can't teach enthusiasm. Tom, you don't start a company that ranks members at a club. You go to club to club around America, you'll make millions of dollars. You know, take it out of here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's move on. Question number five. What would be your advice for tennis professionals who aspire to become tennis directors or tennis department heads at similar to your country clubs such as yours? And yeah, let's uh, start with you on that. I wrote good luck. I wrote him on, and, and I meant it kind of not sarcastically, but you know, sometimes I want to say this right you can be the best in your business and be sitting in here, and sometimes it's just about matter of being in the right place at the right time when the right job opens. And let's say that again you can do everything right, you can be, you can have all the right certifications, but sometimes it's about being in the right place at the right time at the right time at the right club. And so to me, there's just, it's a tough world to advance to the top of the world in the tennis pro area. And then if you do, the best job you have is the one you have right now. Um, that's my only advice. If you think it's greener on the other side, sometimes it's not. And so if you think you're gonna go somewhere and get another job, that's all I wanna say on that. You know, it's not easy to go to be a number one in tennis. My only comment to that is uh, I, I would not want to see uh, an assistant in tennis pro that doesn't want to be the head pro, yeah. doesn't want to be the director. And I think that that should be goal one. Um, so I mean, it's really it's really that simple. And I think one of the things as, as someone working up in the ranks is to try and promote how tennis is relevant and can be combined with other facets of the operation. People that think just tennis centric. They're not going to be as successful, and they're not going to, they're not going to be knowing, known as a team player for a global operation. If you're going to join a tennis club or, or work at a tennis club, that's a different scenario. But if you're going to, if you're going to have a career in, in the country club life, you've got to be able to say, I'm relevant, and I understand the big picture. So how I can tie in tennis with fitness or whatever, but that kind of gets into another question. Great. Right. Jill? Yeah, I, I agree with everything they said. The other thing that I would say is know who you're working for. If you're, if you're wanting to get to the next level, um, it's not just about the job. It's, mm -hmm. it's the person ahead of you that's going to have the same goals that you do. If that person doesn't want you to get ahead, you're probably not going to. So you need to work for somebody that cares as much about your goals and, and where you're going to end up as you do. Because that person will get you there, they'll take care of you, they'll give you the skills that you need, and they will also help you to find that next position because they care about you and where you're going, not just about the job that you can do for them. So I would say critical for you is who is who you work for. And if you know and if you're working for somebody that you don't think really cares about you, then you probably got one more stop before you move to the next one. Because you do need that. And that person will continue to support you even after you're on the same level as they are. Um, you know, the, the other thing that I would say too, is, and I'm speaking to the choir here because you're all here for this meeting, but be active in your association because every single person sitting in this room one day could be a lead for you, could be a help for you, could be a reference for you. And it takes a team sometimes to get up to that next level and to be the first one in charge. So use your network, use your friends, use that activity. Um, last thing is when you do look for that job, be sure it's a culture that fits you. You can only fake who you are for so long. And I used to laugh, I, I'm a really good friend with Damon Diorio at Charlotte Country Club. You're talking about two different styles. We all, we have probably the same goals, ideas, ethics, morals, 
But they would run me out of that club thinking I had lost my <laughs> mind. The first time I hugged the eight first eight people that came to the club. And if he walked over, they'd right. say, oh my God, he's physical. Right. You know, and he's really not. It's right. just, it's part a culture. Right. Part of the culture is where, right. we, where we fit in. And it's, you know, it, yeah, Valentine, it's a pretty laid back kind of a culture. And somebody stuffy would never fit in that club. So, you know what? If you want longevity when you do go for that job, find a club that fits your, don't just chase the money in the job. Be strategic in your planning as to what you're going to do because you're going to be so much more successful long term. Good. Good. That's great insight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, question number six. We're looking at uh, identifying trends maybe in, in the country club business. And do you see a definitive trend with tennis departments combining management operations with <coughs> and or spa and or aquatics? And if so, how has that affected your overall operation and the staffing of that operation? Yeah, I mean, I was, uh, and that's how I answered it, that I actually had thought about that back in the early 90s with Mike Puck at one time at Glen Eagles about doing multiple things with him. And, and uh, we did that at Rock Barn. And, and in July 1st of this year, Kevin will be in charge of fitness and aquatics. They'll fall under his umbrella. and. Um, he'll expand, um, well, well we, we think a lot about Kevin, and, and so I like to think of something with our department as let's grow old together. And so um, with Kevin, you know, being one of those people I'd love to grow old with together is I'm trying to think of new ways to take his leadership skills and put them under other umbrellas that could get him less time on the court <coughs> and maybe more time in his salary. So. Um, he's really, not not everybody fits that and not everybody can do that, but he can. And so he'll be in charge of what we call um, tennis and fitness. And, and they're right next to those campuses sit by one another. Um, a lot of children go through tennis and those. So I believe in it wholeheartedly if it works for the right fit in the right club. Um, yeah, I mean, from a P&L perspective, I would not ever see the two combining. Uh, but from an operational standpoint and success, uh, I mean, this has been it's a great way to put it over the last couple of years um, that with tennis connecting with fitness. You know, we started with cardio, tennis, and things of that nature, but there's been a lot of commingling there. And, and an awful lot of commingling, as, as I think Gavin mentioned, about the, the, the food and beverage operation. Um, you know, I, I, I very much encourage tennis directors and head golf professionals, and you guys are trying to plan some of these events. Tie in F and B because you know food and beverage cocktails and sports they do work even though you don't necessarily drink too much before you're playing tennis. Uh, it, That's your club. People love to enjoy that afterwards, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it does because again you, you want to make it you want to make it exciting. You want to make it feel tired going out to play a round robin going home. You know, I, I could see it being a natural fit. We don't, we don't have that, but but we do have a unique situation because our our, our tennis and all of our children's programming and fitness and aquatics is all at, at a different campus about a mile away. So it's all housed under the same location. So there is some resources that are already being shared, like some of the some of the office staff and things mm -hmm. like that. We we haven't combined them, um, and I don't know that I've really even thought about doing that. I, you know, I don't I don't know if. Um, I think that Kevin probably could take over the fitness. I'm not so sure William would do the tennis. So, um, so I think it, it, a natural transition would be it have to be the tennis, probably you know professionals on that end that would do it. So I'm not opposed to it. I just don't know that I've ever had the circumstance to think about it. So it would just be if it, if it happened. I don't think, I think we just have to see. <coughs> All right, question number seven. What commonalities or differences in your view is there between the staffing of your club's golf department versus the tennis department? And in your opinion, how do tennis professionals compare to golf professionals? So that's a wide open question. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how about we begin with you? Yeah, we can start with you. Okay, great. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just say this. I, I consider uh, the, the tennis the director and the head golf professional uh, very, very parallel. I mean, objective number one, uh, and promote the game. Uh, so I think I think they're, they're very common in that respect. Um, I mean, the rest of it is is it, again, it's, it's all very similar. I see the positions extremely parallel. You know, they, they have to be creative. They they want people to be involved in tournaments. 
Uh, they have to mix it up. They have to tap all bases in terms of hitting different levels, whether it's men, women, children. And, you know, so I, I see them extremely parallel. Jim? It, I, I think I uh, absolutely do agree. I just wrote down here, I don't see a difference as a professional just in the job that they, that they are required to do. As a matter of fact, I think it's critical that you have your golf pro and your tennis professional being able to work together to come up with combined events. As I, as I mentioned before, I said it would kind of, kind of encompassing another answer, but I mean, I think that we've grown both <coughs> golf and tennis by having joint events that we have done because we've introduced them. And so they're not so, they're not so cubby hole. You gotta make it fun. Um, be, and you guys sort of take competition out of it, but I think once you do that, so I'm really fortunate that I've got two professionals that work well together and don't really have anything, you know, but, and the thing too is it takes the competition out of it. I have been in clubs where there was very definite competition between the golf and between the tennis and they're fighting for funds and what's happening. Now I will say that in those cases, it's, it's the person in charge. I control, um, I control the board, which controls the money, which controls the environment, which controls the culture. So if you allow that to happen, um, and we just don't have that culture because I don't, I don't believe in that. I believe that everybody is important. If not, then just get rid of the amenity altogether because it's not as important as the other thing. Um, but there is a balance in act, and I think all of you would mm -hmm. agree to that. But I will say that I think it's a better environment. Everybody thrives when you do not have that competition between your two professionals, and everybody feels like they're getting their share of it, and every you know, and you do care as much about one or the other, and they start caring about each other when they're able to, to work together and do something successful um, and, and a joint you know, project. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on the yeah. same one, you know, um, and the gentleman in the back know that you know we're we're across the board of commonalities. Each each shop has four pros. Each shop has a shop person. Um, each each area has maintenance assistants. Um, the golf course maintenance obviously larger, but we have our maintenance department that takes care of tennis. <coughs> um, you know, one day I spent some time with golf and explained to them how easy they had it, and they were like, "Come on." And I said, well, uh, a member walks in, they see you for six minutes, they're gone for four hours, then you see them for three minutes, and then they go drink. Tennis pros and tennis players are in a bubble all day long with the members. They're with the members all day long. So when you want to go do that, you come and see me and tell me how difficult it is because you spent six minutes and eight seconds with the member when they checked in, and then you didn't see them. And, and that, that, that hour of conversation was a... Uh, was, uh, it's a paradigm shift in their thinking about how easy they did have it compared to tennis pros. Because as you know, in tennis, you've got nowhere to run or hide. You're stuck in the bubble with members where golf pros aren't, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and there's another one where people get enamored with the golf pro to a certain degree because they can play so good. And, and, you know, tennis is not the same love affair there. So um, I, uh, I stand up a lot for, ten for our tennis director and what we believe in tennis, although golf obviously brings us in a chunk of change, but if you had it in the golf maintenance, they bring us in nothing, right? So I remind him of that, so. Yeah. All right, let's move on to our, our last question. And uh, when conducting interviews for your tennis staff, can you help us identify any constructive tips for eligible candidates? And, uh, yeah, Dress sharp, be punctual, know something about the club, do not name drop, and do not tell everybody how great you are. I think that's what exactly what I put in my answer. Um, I have basically said kind of what I mentioned earlier, that uh, I think it's key to uh, express how the tennis operation is relevant to success like I think that's really important right out of the gate to, to kind of accomplish any kind of progress. Oh yeah. I don't know that you understand the magnitude of tennis's impact on the club and that you understand the global environment. I I had written down to um, be sure that your resume shows that you're balanced. That you balance meaning that you're you're you do have activities in junior men and women's program, community work, you're involved in your association, list any awards you have. Um, just be sure that you don't overshow one or the other. For instance, if you happen to be someone who does a lot of speaking engagements, don't list them all. Because then it looks like you're never at your club, you're always at speaking engagements. Um, so you know, so what you need to do is just to list the ones that you think would be the most impressive and key. 
um, <coughs> and fit in. I just, you need to show, you need to be unique. You need to, it's so important for you to go in and be yourself. I've seen people that have come into interviews and honestly you could tell that it just wasn't natural and they weren't being themselves. I can see through that. I, you know, I, I gotta tell you, those of us that have been in club management for a while, we can smell bull a long ways off. So we can smell it also in an interview. So if you're not being who you are and you're not comfortable in your own skin and you're not being unique, it's just, just like blood to a shark. We're gonna pick up on it in a second. We're gonna know that. And we either think you're hiding something or you're just not gonna be a good fit. Um, I agree, know the club you're going to. You can go on their website. You can call, you can trace down, you can call people. Show them that you cared enough about the job to interview, to look, and to know. So do your homework. Just don't go in thinking, mm, I'm just gonna go in on my laurels. Nobody gets jobs on their laurels anymore. The world's changing. Um, ask questions. So if, if I'm doing the interview, ask me questions. Let me know that you're engaged and you're listening. Even if you repeat the same thing, and you know, I mean, it doesn't even matter whether it's a normal report. Just, just I'm engaged, I'm listening. And I think the last thing is, if there's something you want that interviewer to know about you that he's not asked, well, don't offer it. Don't, don't just say, God, I wish you'd ask me this question. Well, he didn't. So be sure that before you walk out of that interview, they know everything about you that you want them to know. Because it's, it's a two-way street. You're going to be interviewing them as much as they're going to be interviewing you. Again, because you want to be sure that it's a fit that you work out. The last thing you want to do is take a job that you're either one miserable or number two, you're not going to last in because it's a resume buster. So that would be my advice. That's a great point. So let's, uh, let's take some questions from the audience, and we, I just wanted to take one caveat. Uh, we want to make sure we're not asking any sensitive information, the confidential information for the club, so I'm not sure they would want to divulge anything confidential. So let's start, so I think you were first up. Well, I have a question about trends, and uh, when y'all were talking about family is the bedrock, I mean, family memberships are, they're the people who stay members of the club for 25 or 30 years, and it seems like in recent times there's been a trend to like, and there's always a question with tennis departments about letting non-members come and be part of your junior program, letting non-members be, you know, fill out an adult league team. Um, then you've got junior members, you've got some clubs that will allow uh, someone who has a family to join as a single. How do you see those trends going? I mean, from a management standpoint, um, what are your thoughts on that as far as non-members coming in or specialty memberships? I'll go. I, I will tell you, when we started our junior program, we had to allow some, right. some non-members to come in. We didn't have enough to, to get it going, and we had people that wanted to play. It, that was the only area that we allowed non-members in. I think it's grown to the point now that we don't really have that many. With the, with the understanding that they, that they would have to drop out if they started to fill up. So that's the only one. Other than that, it's only members. Because, and that was just, we needed a kickstart. So that was for a, a purpose and it was a time and it wasn't forever. Um, the problem is, if you allow too many non-members out there, what's the point of member joining? You're never gonna get those initiation or those dues because I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's just, so that, I mean, that's kind of that's kind of where we are on it. And um, it, if it's a need, we absolutely have to do it. We allow it, but it doesn't happen very much at all. We're on the same way. I mean, my only thought is, be all in. If, if you're, yeah. if you want non-members, then then everybody should be all in. If you want to, you know, have walk it up. Prior to Mike's arrival at Glen Eagles, they had a huge non-member following. It was great money, and a non-member woman beat the president's of the club's wife in the championship, and non-memberships didn't exist the next year. <laughs> and it's a true story. And then they wanted to bring them back, and when, when Mike came on board, they were reintroducing it. And it's like, really, you want us to come back? Hey, guy, you know. It's a true story, I mean, you know. You can't make that stuff up. Yeah. And again, I think it goes back to my comment earlier about the, the two different clubs I see in this economy. Um, you know, we do not allow or something like that, we, we allow that, but we do keep an eye on it. But the reason why people join a club is for that exclusivity. Um, so, and, but again, we're successful. Eric does a phenomenal job keep, you know, keeping uh, the attendance strong. But if that's not there, that's the other kind of club that might have to make those exceptions. 
Let me follow up on that question. Um, so if you, you don't have another vendors in, you have different price price structures for golf as opposed to tennis or fitness? So yes. You can come and join the club for a Four levels, right? For a social, so as far as your social, uh, fitness, tennis, and golf. Tennis by negotiation. Yeah. 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 We have three categories here. Okay. And everybody, every club has the same thing. No, there's so clubs that you either are or you aren't. No clubs. But uh, <laughs> I would say, I say you're younger. Most of all of us are probably you know, 20 years old. Uh, 25. 25. Or so, yeah. so we're all youngsters here. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think it started changing because of dynamics um, versus some of your older <coughs> clubs in the area where, and some of your older clubs now have actually started social memberships. But that's been the last probably 20 years. But I'm um, the oldest yeah. at the table. You're the oldest at the table. table. Are you 30? Oh, that was the point. You were oh. the first club Chris, in Um, uh, well, ours is 1999 is when our club was built. Yes, this is the Yeah, that was 96. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, other questions? <laughs> Mike, and then Tom. I heard each of the three of you mention a little bit of the terms, mission, vision, and core values of your mission statement for the club. Is that something you communicate and to the pros and get their staff to buy into and you dedicate time for them to do that instead of chasing lessons on the court. I mean, they're responsible for the management and the implementing of that core value and it's cross reference with the different departments. Do you talk about that and have kind of a monitor for that? Yes, I mean, it may not be every sure. week, but I mean, guys are sitting here, you pretty much know what our mission, our vision, and our core values are. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. so it's 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 more of a, it's, it's I mean, I don't, we don't sit there at every meeting and go, okay, let's remind our mission, vision. I mean, we, 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 have a, we have a board retreat that looks at it, reviews it once a year as part of the strategic plan, and then if they make any changes, then it brings it back down and I introduce it to the staff. It doesn't change much, sometimes we'll tweak it, you know, but our core values are diversity and being environmentally responsible, being community driven, um, family focused. I mean, so they're you know, and they're genuine and, hospitality. Yeah, and they know exactly what those what those core values are and what the expectations. Our mission and vision are very much similar. Just that we are going to be a premier family focused club. Well, when you say you're family focused, that pretty much tells a, a whole a whole lot about what you are and what you do. So, and the thing about it is, uh, Valentine Country Club has always had that mission. Uh, mission, vision, and culture, and the core values. So, so for me to come in, it was e it was an easy transition because it was kind of already there. It's just part of what the culture was, and all I do is just keep it alive. See, when I first got here a little over five years ago, the club had its own mission statement, yeah. and there wasn't a department head that had a clue what it was. Mm -hmm. um, not yeah. yeah. So that, you know, it was. So the first thing I did was come in. And I said, all right, this is what I see on paper. What do you guys believe in? Where do you think you're headed? What is your goal? What is, what is the vision of this club? So as a team, uh, we came up with, with what we felt it should be, and then I, I took that and brought it to the board and changed the mission statement for the club. But that's something I agree. It's something that we visit probably once a year um, because you know, you're, you're constantly refreshing your, your strategic plan, but you have to know what the end game is. And, and also, it helps, <laughs> also helps everybody to understand that they work together. I'm constantly talking about not one cog on this wheel is more important than another. <coughs> when I have those, you know, weekly departmental. And we get right to, you know, Kevin and them in the back of the room know that, that I get right to the point. And, and the downside is, is that there's X amount of people in the tennis industry that, that are based on the greed of money. And so we pay, we pay good money, and they get out of their car and teach all day and get in their car and go home. And so we just get nothing for our money because that's what they did all day. And then they complain to say, well, you know, I'm on, I do this. But, but you know, and then when you say, well, could you do this? Well, you know, I'm pretty busy and stuff like that. And so, you know, the downside is that sometimes the greed of money takes over a person from being a better tennis director or being a tennis manager because they don't want to delegate more lessons to somebody junior because it's coming out of their pocket. So, but the club is paying them a salary to be a leadership and a director. So you have to ask yourself when you get in your car, am I interested in the greed for the money? Which is okay, I mean, I'm not telling anybody how to live. But at the same time, am I getting our money from our club? So Kevin knows, he's regulated to so many hours and you know, we, we've had those discussions and we try to work that through honestly versus manipulating it because everybody has families and issues and problems. 
So, but there is a fine line of like, man, I gotta get out of my car to get on the lesson so I can teach all day to get home and go do this and run around and take care of my wife and my kids. So that's something we deal with head on. That, that begs the question, do you, are you guys very transparent? Do you articulate how many hours you expect your tennis directors to be on court? So they're really- I don't write it down, but I mean, there's a generalization if every time <coughs> I come to tennis and I'm, now I park on the other side of tennis, okay? It's now the winter time, so I have to walk through the tennis center every day. They don't like seeing me, you know? Um, so I can tell if Kevin's on the court all the time. Because we, we had a Florida chapter seeing the meeting, we were talking about this, that, you know, the tennis pros, we get, get addicted to lessons. I mean, it becomes like, sure. you know. I you get know, it. It's very, it's it's very easy to sit there and say, oh, I can squeeze in two more hours. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and before you know it, that's two more hours a day, it's ten more hours a week. Right. That's a lot of money. I